Welcome to the Nerd Social. I'm John. And I'm Colin. Today we're going to be reviewing The Batman. Uh, this is starring Robert Pattinson, Zoe Kravitz, Jeffrey Wright, and directed by Matt Reeves. And it just premiered this past Friday. And we will start off with our spoiler-free review. So, Colin, starting with you, what did you think? Wow, this is uh, lots to talk about in this movie. Uh, there was just so much, uh, so much compact within the three-hour time frame. I think that it was definitely well deserved to have it within the three hours. Um, and I was looking at my clock. I was basically on a Friday. I, I got there at four p.m. I think there was only about five or ten minutes of trail. It was about ten minutes of trailers. It, usually, you have about fifteen or twenty minutes, but they just went right into the movie um, after that ten-minute trailer stuff. And then, and then, basically, uh, you know, at the very end of the movie, when the credits start rolling, it was literally seven o'clock. So, so you are do, you are in immersed in this world for about three hours and fifty minutes, pretty much. I mean, two hours, fifty minutes, not three hours, two hours, fifty minutes. So, I think that you you are just you just kind of and not edge of your seat, but also you're just kind of thrilled to kind of see all the different world building, um, all the different characters all the different types of uh, things that are going on within within Gotham City. And it's just it's just so it's compelling. It's compelling theater. And I just think that it was it was just kind of very tightly well done. Uh, not fast paced. It was there there's places where it was slow, yes, but it was necessary. There was places that was action patched, which was necessary. Um, and it was just kind of Overall, just really well done, and I really highly recommend that people do see it because I think it's a very good interpretation of some things that we've seen before, but some things we have not. So, um, so we'll get more into that during the spoiler review part. But generally, uh, I loved it. I think you should again go watch it as soon as you can. Yeah, I agree. The um, it was a very entertaining movie for me, and. Um... I, I think it ranks up there and with the other Batman movies that we've seen. I, I, for me, it's top two. It really is. And uh, mm -hmm. it, it, the pacing of the movie, yes, it's a little on the slow side. But then again, it's, it's a detective movie that happens to have Batman in it. So it's the first time we ever get to see a full-fledged detective story with Batman, I think. There were some elements in some of the other Batman movies that we've seen, but this one definitely leaned heavily into that. And uh, to me, it also came off as more of an art house Batman movie as well. Uh, just some of the way they had, uh, they were shooting some of the uh, characters, the actors, uh, lots of close-ups, lots of lingering shots. Uh, so, it, mm -hmm. so it definitely felt like it, I can see how some people might say it's dragging out a little bit too long, but I, I like it. I like all that. It helped establish mm -hmm. the mood, the atmosphere, the dread, the overall dread throughout the whole movie that you felt. And uh, it's definitely, to me, very, very entertaining. So, uh, you know, I, I, I compare it kind of to uh, kind of like, uh, I, I guess, a little on like Logan. You know, Logan wasn't just full of mm. action or anything like that, but it was definitely a, a very condensed story. Um, and you're very, you're, you're, you're invested into the story that's going on, what's on screen. And there's some quiet moments here and there that definitely, uh, helps establish some of the character and background for, uh, for a lot of the players in this movie. So again, overall, I enjoyed it very much. Uh, top two for me among Batman movies and, uh, definitely mm -hmm. everyone should go see it, but yes, it's definitely long. Yes. <laughs> So yeah, definitely. So um, with that, let's uh, we can dive into the uh, spoiler, uh, full of spoiler review. But uh, but before we continue on, uh, just a, a reminder to everyone: if you like our content, please uh, like and subscribe, and uh, we'll be sure to get more of what you like. So uh, right up there, and uh, into the uh, spoiler review. You've been warned. And uh, mm -hmm. let's uh, dive right into it. So, uh, what did you think? Let's let's talk more about uh, uh, or, uh, the details of it, uh, um, especially particularly this story of the Batman. It, it took lots of inspirations from many different sources, as we could see. What were some of the ones that you found yes. and picked out, Colin? Yeah, I think for me, um, 
I mean, you can mention more in detail about the Long Halloween, but uh, but definitely the Long Halloween was heavily influenced. I think that uh, in terms of the Riddler, <laughs> I think that there was a lot of elements of Zodiac, uh, the movie Zodiac that was starring Robert Downey Jr. and Mark Ruffalo. Um, it was about the Zodiac killer back in the 60s, I think it was. <laughs> Lots of that type of thing going on. And also Seven. Uh, the movie with um, uh, Brad Pitt and Morgan Freeman. This was done in the '90s, I think it was. And I, when I watched that movie, that was just that was that was very, very compelling and thrilling, and also extremely violent. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but there, there's definitely tones of that, you know, with him trying to rid Gotham City of corruption and him being like almighty, you know, almighty judger of. Of, of what's corrupt in Gotham. And so a lot of that element that, that was played in the movie seven, you know, Kevin Spacey's <clears throat> character being, you know, the judger of all the people that are sinful and killing them. He basically did the same thing here. And I just, I just felt that, you know, as you kind of, pro- because it was a movie that was a little close to three hours long, you needed to have all those beats in order to appreciate the level of, the level of um, psych, the level of psychos- the psychoticness of, of of the man, but also like, what is his justification? Even though it's it's so, um, it is so kind of psychotic and evil and gripping, you know. At the same time, so you had to have all those pieces in order to in order to really appreciate the plan that he was doing. You know, you see a lot of the superhero movies, the plans that we that we've seen before. Um, I think you go back to Batman v Superman or also Civil War from for Marvel. It was kind of convoluted what the plan was, but this was very kind of succinct as to what the plan was, and it was kind of a leading the audience into a into a concluding puzzle piece. So of course, you know, it, it all ties into the Riddler and things like that. So I think that that would really stuck to me was the Riddler's kind of. Um, that the inspiration behind the Riddler was the one that's most fascinating to me. Yeah, the um, definitely seven, definitely seven, uh, and uh, Zodiac. I can definitely see that. That's the the sense of dread I spoke to, spoke of earlier, including mm-hmm. the atmosphere. You know, you've got a serial killer on the loose, and uh, and he's playing a game of it, and uh, and sometimes, uh, and we've seen. Uh, uh, we've seen that, and sometimes it, it invokes some of the real world uh, craziness that uh, happened. You know, Zodiac's based on a true story. Seven, while fictional, it definitely invokes a lot of that as well. Uh, so, if mm-hmm. you know, Seven being directed by David Fincher, if David Fincher were to make the Batman that everybody has wanted, this movie was it, right? This movie was mm-hmm. it. This definitely invoked a lot of David Fincher's style and, uh, and pacing as well. Uh, some of the comic book inspiration you spoke of Long Halloween, definitely that was there. Uh, they took pieces of um, uh, Falcone and, and the way uh, Batman interacts with uh, Catwoman and certainly the way the mm-hmm. deaths are kind of laid out, uh, you know, uh, pieces of uh, Falcone's um, uh, or everyone is related to Falcone in some way uh, uh, of some of these deaths and so forth. So that definitely invokes a lot of uh, the Long Halloween, uh, not the exact plot in any way but they definitely mm-hmm. took pieces of right. it. just like uh, and when you and i were also discussing offline about how uh, there are definitely elements of long halloween that was in the dark knight as well mm-hmm. uh, they definitely took pieces Absolutely. of this yeah and they definitely took pieces from uh batman year one um again invoking the way catwoman uh is in that mm-hmm. uh in that uh, uh graphic novel and batman earth one particularly i think it was the uh, second volume where Riddler is a serial killer in that one, if I'm not mistaken. I, I'm, I'm trying to remember mm-hmm, exactly mm-hmm. which one it was. but uh, So they definitely took lots of different pieces of it and made it into this uh, new Batman story. Um, so and, and, uh, and put it all together with, uh, um, with what we got on screen. Again, um, Matt Reeves did a great job, I think, establishing that atmosphere, um, particularly 
with uh, making the Riddler very scary. They didn't have that stupid outfit on him that we see with the question marks <laughs> and the green and so forth. Yeah. So all that is definitely uh, a far cry from the 1966 uh, campy version of the Riddler or even Jim Carrey's uh, Riddler as well. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, right. So how do they dress him up? They dress him up in this weird winter coat and uh, look like right. uh, this uh, with the goggles and the, and the mask and so forth completely covered so they definitely made, uh, made him look a little bit more like um uh, like the serial killer from valentine's day it just invoked a little bit of that mm -hmm. uh, for me, right? or my bloody valentine i'm sorry my bloody valentine <laughs> Mm. Yeah, one other inspiration that we did talk about um, was the uh, was Arkham. Actually, mm -hmm. some of the Arkham games, yes. uh, especially the especially the graffiti, straight out of Arkham. Yeah, straight out of the <laughs> Arkham games, and it was just like, and you know, him going into the in, what was it into the one of the facilities. I think when Batman came into one of the facilities, that was straight out of Arkham, and it, it de definitely definitely had had some like i was when i was watching i was like wow they really actually went there yeah. so i i was very thrilled to kind of see all these different elements and inspirations come together in such a really nice package as well and i think also the penguin you know colin farrell's you know played by brilliantly by carol colin farrell i mean he that that kind of um, the motif or the or the style came straight from the Arkham game in some in some yep. ways, you know, without the without the eye eye eyeglass, yep. I think. But for the most part, it's pretty much the Arkham game right there, the Iceberg Lounge, all that's from I all that's from Arkham. So I was really really thrilled about that too. Yeah, um, speaking of Colin Farrell, I, I thought he was fantastic. Completely unrecognizable in that makeup that he's had mm -hmm. um, put on him. And uh, it, it, just his voice, I think he got right. Uh, the dude can do accents very, very well. And I'm, I'm very impressed how he does it. He got it. a little bit of the New York New York yeah, accent Yeah, the there. New York or, or that yeah, mobster but, type, the yeah. way they all talk. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and, of course, according to the Arkham games, everybody talks like that. Every bad guy talks like that. Right? <laughs> and uh, so maybe a little bit of stereotyping there. But, yes, uh, the club, yeah. they, they that was also in the comics and Arkham as well. Uh, but as you mentioned, uh, Gotham City, uh, as we talk a little bit more about some of the characters, we can jump right to Gotham City. I thought they did a great job of making Gotham City a character in itself because, mm -hmm. um, again, as you and I were talking a little bit offline about this, the um, the backdrop, the, um, the styling is definitely a fictional city, but that fictional city is... Um, you know, it sounds, it's like it's kind of meshed a little bit with some of the modern takes. Uh, looks like a little bit of New York, a little bit of Chicago, but at the same time, uh, a fictional, as you mentioned, uh, uh, Tim Burton style as well. Maybe a little bit of touch of what we saw in the comics. And uh, I'm sorry, not the comics, the, the cartoon series, Batman, the animated series. Mm -hmm. um, right. So it just makes it a world where it seems like. Yes, it, the city needs help. It's constantly referenced throughout. This city is just a scary place. Uh, people need to get out of there or people need to save it. And, uh, and I thought they did a really good job of portraying that, uh, particularly Matt Reeves, showing mm -hmm. that this city is it's a scary place. And it's pretty dark and pretty grim, very, uh, uh, very much in need of a, of a rehabilitation. And, uh, and and that's mm -hmm. also the uh, the recurring theme in the background too about renewal, 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 renewal. Yeah, yeah. and uh, and the city needing it, and they did a great job again of showing how much that city really needed that renewal. But also how how it's been corrupted yeah. into by by the mob and by powerful interests within the city, and how the and how Falcone is pretty much the 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 puppeteer, mm -hmm. you know, pulling all the strings. You know, with the police commissioner, with the mayor, you know, setting up, setting up um, uh, Maroney, you know, for him to for him to fall and all of that was all under him. And so it was really fascinating to kind of see how deep the corruption was. And also at the fact that Thomas Wayne was part of that type of corruption in a lot of ways and how, you know, Bruce gets almost in some ways very portrayed by the fact that his father 
had his hands dirty in this type of in, in this type of way uh, when he was running for mayor and stuff like that. And one thing I did mention to you, John, in um, offline, I think it was yesterday. I mentioned that they did allude to the Flashpoint paradox, the animated show, yes, animated uh, movie, mm-hmm. and it was very very interesting. You know, if people watch that uh, watch that animated uh, animated movie. Yes. It was it was pretty much so. So basically, the Flash went back it went went Flash Four mm-hmm. or something like that, or went back. Was he Flash? Was he Flash Four or back in time? I don't remember uh, which one. He was. went back, but at the same time, it was an alternate universe. So, yeah, alternate universe. So what happened was that in the alternate universe, you know, Thomas Wayne became mm-hmm. Batman because Bruce was the one who died, mm-hmm. and so in the Martha Wayne. W- actually became the Joker in that iteration. And so it kind of explored the mental illness of Martha Wayne. And so it was very interesting in that they took that piece Mm -hmm. and they kind of went, went with it and be, and it became a, 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 it became a theme as to why, you know, he wanted to have, um, he wanted to have that reporter eliminated Mm -hmm. in some ways. He didn't really him, but he wanted him to be, taken care of and so you know the mob you know Falcone's going to just do what he what, what he wants to do but of course he made that deal you know yeah. to kind of say get rid of the guy yeah and so because of because of his wife's mental illness so so it ties in a little bit into the flashpoint paradox in a lot of ways so i found that very fascinating and very big deep cut um that happened there yeah they it seems like the more recent batman stories um have really leaned hard into uh, his father, Thomas Wayne, um, definitely operating or doing things in gray areas uh, quite a bit. Mm. So we've seen that reflected in several comic stories, also in animation and also now in The Batman. Um, I, I believe they leaned into that as well into the Gotham TV series. And uh, we. Mm-hmm. And as for Martha yep. Wayne uh, and, and, and a lot of the Arkham lore, the Arkham Asylum lore too, and her connections to all of that uh, and her mental illness, that's definitely alluded to in several stories now. Uh, I, I believe in Earth One that's there as, as well. And uh, so mm-hmm. in addition to Flashpoint Paradox, we, we see that there. So, so they definitely want to create more of... Uh, they're definitely tapping into many different areas that have been uh, retconned quite a bit uh, to try, I guess, to make the stories a lot more interesting as well. Uh, definitely makes right. a darker take on Batman and where he uh, and how he comes to grips with the fact that where where is his place? What is his legacy and his parents' legacy? And that's uh, that's truly being explored throughout this movie as well. Um, mm-hmm. So talking about, let's talk about Batman himself. Uh, what, what did you think about Robert Pattinson's interpretation of Batman and Bruce Wayne in this movie? I think it was pretty solid. I think overall a pretty solid take on on who he was. You know, he he mentioned about that he's vengeance, and it was very chilling when he when he did that with the uh, with the with the gang, uh, the the kind of like the pre Joker gang on, on the subway, just mentioning that he was that he is who. Like he already had her, he already has a reputation already. <clears throat> and so like people are fearful of, of what's creeping up under the shadows and stuff like that. So he has that type of effect on criminals. And I, I just feel as though he was he really is still trying to find himself as Batman uh, and trying to find because it's all for him, it's all about anger and vengeance. It's not it's not um there's no there's no going around that. It's it, it's very much like he's starting off, but he's just he is just full of rage, yeah. <laughs> and you can definitely see that in a lot of what he does throughout the movie. Um, I think that Robert Pattinson definitely uh, as Bruce Wayne, he's still trying to find himself. They didn't really focus too much on him as Bruce Wayne because you know they focus a lot more on Batman, him being the detective and things like that. Um, I kind of kind of saw him as like his emo phase of uh, of batman <laughs> you know the teenage angst you yeah. know and you you heard the the song from from kurt cobain you know it's teenage angst that's all it is from the 90s and they had a nirvana uh, song in there twice you know yeah <laughs> yeah so so yeah so it's like it's all it's all emo yeah. stuff so and then and then what uh, what i really do appreciate is the uh is the eye makeup on ron uh, you know, when he removed the mask, because, you know, there's obviously, you know, in, in the other iterations of Batman, they put eye makeup there, but they did not show it. And it's like, 
Why? Yeah, magically <laughs> it disappears show. every time he takes off the mask, right? But in this movie, exactly. he kept it on. <laughs> he he kept it on, and I appreciate I appreciate that little effect that Matt Reeves and um, and Rob Pattinson, you know, he went full bore with that. So I, I just I just think that there there there's those little subtleties that I that I you know as a Batman fan I generally appreciate that they that they did that. I also appreciate the fact that it is a detective story. You know, if you play the Arkham games, it's all about him being a detective. Mm -hmm. And so I think that having that type of that type of interpretation is really good because, again, you only saw snippets of it in the in in the Nolan Batman, you know, here and there. You saw snippets of it in in the Burton Batman, but not so much. Not so. I mean, even in even in Batman v Superman, there was snippets of it here, Mm -hmm. but it wasn't like a full fledged um you know, detect a story like you said before. So I, I think that in terms of him, you know, is he the best um, in my take? I, I don't know. I, I, I have to kind of watch more of him to kind of figure out if he is because the other, the other Batman have had several movies before they, before, before anything. But for me, I still, I mean, for me, I, I, I still like Ben Affleck because I, I, I just like his, interpretation of it uh even though it's like more justice league and stuff like that i i liked it more uh, i mean it's 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 somewhat controversial because i think that a lot of people like keaton a lot more um and i understand that but i, I think that keaton is more of the safe choice type whereas you know i'm more kind of i don't want to go with go with conventional wisdom <laughs> in a lot of ways i just want to go against conventional wisdom mm-hmm. so that's why i'm kind of I'm kind of leaning toward Affleck, but also I, I'm giving some I'm giving some props to Pattinson as well. Yeah, I thought Pattinson did a pretty good job as Batman. Um, as Bruce mm-hmm. Wayne, he, um, the jury's still out. Uh, the only thing mm-hmm. I didn't I, I didn't enjoy as much or appreciate as much is it, I, I get that this is supposed to be his second year of Batman, right? He's he's in his right. second year of Batman, so he's still making some mistakes. Uh, and we saw a big mistake, right? When he uh, did that wingsuit and tried to go under that bridge <laughs> yes. and did not go well. <laughs> no, it did not. Uh, he should be dead after that, right? Uh, because oh, yeah. uh, I, I get that his suit is bulletproof, but my gosh, he, he should have lots of broken bones underneath that thing. But um, mm-hmm. his his interpretation of, of Bruce Wayne is, uh, I, I saw it as he did a horrible job of separating his personas, right? <laughs> to me, it was a exact same he persona. It, he's exactly the same as Batman. He's exactly the same as Bruce Wayne. He's a recluse. He's a brooding, brooding, brooding every single scene. And so because he, there's no separation like the way, let's say, all the other Batman interpretations where they're clearly different, you got that billionaire playboy that he purposely plays up to try to throw people off, right? Um but here we don't see any of that at all. And so it leads me to believe no. like somebody like Jim Gordon who sees him just goes, uh, Bruce, <laughs> you know, uh, I'm yeah. totally expecting him to do that. Right. And because there's no separation. So that, that's the only criticism I had about the differences on how he played that. And I agree with you. Uh, Ben, Ben Affleck to me is, is the, um, is the best interpretation of Bruce Wayne slash Batman. Just the, the physique, the, the the chiseled face and uh, and just the way he his mannerisms and his take on Bruce Wayne, which is why I wish um, this the Batman was written for uh, um, Ben Affleck. But uh, and and if everyone knows just by doing some Google research, Ben Affleck originally had this story, and then Matt Reeves came along and and completely made it its own. He rewrote it to make it fit with what he wanted. And uh, Mm -hmm. so he took over for Ben Affleck. So originally Ben Affleck had this work on the Batman. Uh, So I agree with you. It's uh, definitely uh, uh, Ben Affleck should have been the guy is the guy for me. That's uh, that's the preeminent Batman. Um, Mm -hmm. So there, there's a couple things where Batman also um, is definitely used. This movie is used for certain social commentaries as well. Uh, particularly when he criticized with uh, in front of Cat well, to Catwoman about uh, her dead girlfriend and uh, mm-hmm. uh, about Annika. Basically, he was alluding to, well, she shouldn't be messing around with bad people, uh, you know, other, and, which is why she got killed. And um, mm. 
again, that speak to me, it speaks to someone who is just uh, starting out or just coming to a new take or hot take, he thinks. And she basically, Catwoman, uh, puts him in his place, <laughs> corrects him on that. And, and what, what did he say to her? I mean, what did she say to him? <laughs> Think that you you must come from a rich yeah. family or you must come yeah. from wealth exactly you know? and and she was spot on about that because he's just um, mm-hmm. he's got his blind spots he's got his biases and he <clears throat> and that was his hot take at the moment um, she even alludes to um, later on talking about um, bringing down white privilege assholes uh, mm-hmm. uh, so there's definitely uh, a classism or a class warfare that's going on here that's contributing to the corruption. Uh, in the city as well. And then you also pointed out, I believe, uh, there was, uh, uh, tell us a little bit about the, the working class guy that that encounters. Yeah. Yeah, that was very fascinating. That was like during the memorial of the mayor, um, the, the mayor that got killed um, in the beginning of the film. Mm-hmm. And so and so he was basically, you know, trying to speak with Bruce, uh, you know, during the memorial. <laughs> And it was so so very interesting in that, in that he and then I think the the other mayor oral candidate the 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 woman the black woman who was going to be mayor Bella, he Bella kind of Rayo. like yep. yeah yeah he was a he he was kind of asking Bruce to like okay sit over there like sit near the front or something yeah and then and the guy just his whole kind of demeanor just changed because he's like oh so you're basically one of the bad people yeah. you're one of the corrupt people yeah. because you're a rich person you don't do anything for us you're you you basically been a recluse and going back to your point john about about him being a recluse i mean i mean the thing is is that yes if you see more of bruce slash batman you probably will kind of figure out that you can put two and two together true, but the true. fact of the matter is that he you know you you don't get to see batman very often Mm -hmm. and you don't get to see bruce wayne very often so you can't really tell if you're you know if if if, you know baby gordon probably could figure it out because he'll see him more but other than that i i I, you'll have a very hard time (laughs) trying to distinguish the personalities um of of it it's like saying like someone like elon musk Mm -hmm. you know if he you know became batman you know how we know like how will we know if he was Batman? Do we, you know, unless unless there's some some insider who actually who's like an Alfred yep. who really knows that type of stuff. So you you never know what happens to billionaires, you know, and their secret lives. I guess. Fair enough. Fair enough. That's that's probably how they 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 definitely hide that. And uh, anyways, m- moving on to um, Jim Gordon, played by Jeffrey Wright. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, I, I felt as though it. it he did a great job, and he, to me, is one of the best interpretations of Jim Gordon. Uh, the only other guy that's uh, mm-hmm. that's up there, of course, is uh, Gary Oldman, who's great in almost every part that he plays. Um, so mm-hmm. I say Jeffrey Wright's up there, if not better, because the way they portray this character, his character in this movie, definitely a lot more to do, a lot more of the buddy cop formula, a lot more of mm-hmm. uh, interactions. And I especially love how he kept bat- kept calling Batman man or chief or, you know, it just showing how close they got in their relationship, their working relationship with each other. And, you know, every step of the way, he's uh, trying to help Batman out, uh, providing him some top cover among his other uh, cop peers, you know, who are questioning, why is he here? What's he even doing here? Uh, even right. to his superiors at the time, right? So he kept saying, he needs to be here. He needs to be here. And of course, he even helps him out, um, break out among the, uh, uh, the, uh, the police station as well. Right. And, uh, and, I, and again, more funny banter that, that really shows how well they work with each other. With each other. He says, uh, hey, um, you were supposed to pull your punch. And he said, I did. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I did pull my punch, <laughs> and uh, but yeah. So Jeffrey Wright, uh, that that guy is on fire. He's in everything now. He was in what? Uh, no time to die. He was in mm-hmm. Westworld recently. What what else has he been in? That's uh, he, he's in what if? What if? That's Marvel. right. Marvel. What if? Yeah. Uh, he is the uh, the Watcher in there, and uh, yep. so he's all over the place. So uh, good for him. I believe he is a. Um, Washington D.C. area native as well, so uh, it's it's oh, very wow. uh, very cool to see such success for him, and uh, and, and going into it too, uh, you know, I don't know if you saw too, Colin, but I saw a lot of chatter, you know, because he's a black man, 
uh, placed in the mm-hmm. role of a traditionally white character in the comics, there was some backlash uh, for a while. But mm-hmm. recent things that I've seen, uh, people who have watched the movie, I don't know if it's the same people. I didn't see a single negative comment because he just kicked ass, did great in that part. Yeah, I agree. I, I think that he definitely held, not only held his own, but I think that he probably stole the show in some yeah. aspects of the, sure of the movie because – because you know his presence was just so big, and also I think that he was a good counterweight to Bruce uh, to to Batman in a lot of ways too. And I, I just, I, I just, yeah, his interactions definitely were very good. And I think that yeah, he could be in my book. I think that he he could be at the top because I, yeah, Scary Oldman was really good in, in the Dark Knight trilogy, but um, but there were definitely some scenes where where I'm like, wow, he really did well, and I think he surpassed him. Yeah here and there yeah. i don't remember quite quite the scenes what were the scenes but it just like kind of throughout the movie yeah. it just kind of felt felt like wow this is he he is a force to be reckoned with as well yeah, yeah so jeffrey wright um does it again uh, another great job mm-hmm. now catwoman really surprised me did, did she did zoe kravitz surprise you as well um yes i i would say yes because you know she comes from a very famous family uh for those of you that don't don't know she is the daughter of lenny kravitz and uh lisa bonet mm-hmm. and step and stepdaughter to jason momoa yes. you know who played aquaman yeah. so uh so definitely know what else has she been in she's been in like some some movies here and there she's had some success here and there but yeah. nothing she was an x-men first class she was an X-Men first class. Oh, yeah. yeah. She, she was the one she with the wings. <laughs> wings. Yes. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Got it. Yeah. So I, I, I really enjoyed her, her role. I think that, I think that, you know, they definitely pay homage to, uh, to Halle Berry, mm-hmm. to, um, to Arthur Kitt, uh, Catwoman, you know, black Catwoman that has been in the Batman verse yeah. for a while, even though, you know, Halle Berry's, uh, p- portrayal wasn't wasn't as great or yeah. or you know it was kind of disastrous in some ways uh but i think that uh you know her rocking the short hair was awesome because it's kind of like uh goes back to the comics straight out of comics in a lot of ways and again you know her being a black char- character mm-hmm. again sp- speaks to a lot of the paying homages to the to the actors that actresses that were before her yeah. Uh, but she she held her own, and I think that you know her wig, you know the the wig that she put on, mm-hmm. that was really really compelling. I was like, wow, Wait, that, which one? Really, she had a bunch. Really awesome. <laughs> well, the one um, where she was like, where she's like the pink wig, mm-hmm. where she was like walking down, yeah. and then like she was, or also the one where um, she was encountering uh, Falcone, mm-hmm. basically you know confronting him yeah. and trying to murder him. Uh, that was that was just like yeah. wow that you you that takes a lot of guts to do so yeah. I think that overall and and again she held her own against Batman too it's not like it's not like he yeah. but I think the only thing that I that I do criticize about it is that I felt as though the love the love um, kind of like them getting together yeah. being in love with each other yeah. it kind of felt a little rushed. Yeah. It's like yes, we know that they get together, but it's like I think that they could have they could have built that up a little bit more yeah. um, because you don't you don't necessarily see that throughout. It's kind of like okay, is it like love at first sight that they, that okay if it's love at first sight then sure mm-hmm. I think that that would work, but it, it didn't see it didn't seem as though there was there was a there was a a sequence where you can say, okay, it's a slow burn mm-hmm. towards something romantic, right? It didn't really feel that way to me. It just felt like, okay, had this encounter, okay, you know, she did something for him, you know, basically surveilling the the, <laughs> the, the nightclub there. And then, you know, it just kind of, it's just kind of like, oh, just all of a sudden, oh yeah, we forgot. Yeah. Catwoman and Batman are supposed to be together. <laughs> oh yes, let's kiss. And then that was it. And then I was like, okay, it, it, yes, we know that they get together, yeah. but you didn't really... You didn't really tell. You didn't really show me throughout the movie that that was the case. So that that was my only kind of small criticism about. Yeah. That's not just. It's not. It's not about her mm-hmm. per se, but it's more of the writing and you know Matt Reeves writing there. I, I thought there was. Um, I saw it differently. I, I, I definitely thought there was some chemistry there. I, I thought actually I thought there was great chemistry between Robert Pattinson and Zoe Kravitz. Uh, the way they. Mm-hmm. 
just stared each other, stared at each other throughout. Uh, the way he was automatically <laughs> infatuated by her. Uh, I mean, how could he not? She's beautiful. They made her look great in this movie, gorgeous in this movie, in, yes. in every scene. And they really focused on every pretty angle they could uh, on her. And uh, so uh, I, I think they played up on that and, and, and showed that Robert Pattinson was immediately infatuated by her. And, uh, and she mm-hmm. comes off very sultry, like uh, uh, similar to Michelle Pfeiffer, the way she is in some of her, uh, mm-hmm. in, when she played Catwoman in Batman Returns. Uh, so it, to me, it invoked a little bit of that. And yes, Eartha Kitt too, just sly and, you know, you know very slinky, just like uh, uh, you would expect of someone playing a feline character, right? Uh, uh, like Catwoman. Mm-hmm. And um, that's, uh, uh, you know, the way she was with him. I, I thought led to a natural progression. Yes, it was a little fast, uh, but at the same time, I, I yeah. could definitely see that uh, they definitely had great screen presence together. Uh, but mm-hmm. man, she's a tiny little thing. She's <laughs> especially as Robert Pattinson just towers over her. So that I couldn't help but yeah. notice that that there were uh, a huge size difference in that way. But you're right; she held her own. She really surprised me. Um, I've seen her other things, but she never really stuck out. And this, she did a great job. Uh, mm-hmm. And I certainly came away with it going, wow, she really can act. And she did a great job here. I, I didn't see her as Zoe Kravitz. I saw her as Catwoman. And, and I thought she did a great job mm-hmm. there. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, so her, um, and, and some of the lines that they gave, she they definitely gave her some lines to chew up the scenery a little bit and uh, some great stunts as well. And again, uh, a lot of what she offers and brings to the table with the Catwoman story and plot definitely took inspirations from some of the other things, like the Long Halloween, you know, um, uh, especially her connection to Falcone. That definitely came from Long Halloween, uh, from what I remember. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. Yeah. So uh, again, Zoe Kravitz, I thought she did a great job there. Um, let's get to the Riddler, uh, Paul Dano, and uh, and how scary and and twisted he is <laughs> what did you think of paul wow just just amazing performance i just think that there's so much subtlety to him uh you know the the, the shy kind of awkward uh adult uh loner lone wolf but brilliant smart damaged i mean there's so many Damages, right? there's so many personality <laughs> so many da- so many personality layers that he had to that he had to hit and he hit all of them and it's just so menacing in a lot of ways. Yeah. It's just like he's such a menacing character, yeah. and you know he made you he made you feel as though you know your skin's gonna crawl. But it's like but it's like you cannot turn your eyes off of him because he's just too compelling. Um, I think that the fact of him you know having his own social media followers you know plays to our you know current current how world many these users. Days. <laughs> I think it was like over a little like 560 or 565. It was very interesting. It was just like yeah. very fascinating that he had that. And, you know, it alludes a lot to kind of like the fringe. They also use the word fringe. Yeah. They did use the word fringe, yeah. his fringe elements. Yep. And I'm like, yeah, that's uh, that's that's basically their interpretation of someone, something like QAnon. Yeah. QAnon so it's like incels, so right? Yeah. 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 So I'm, I'm just I, – I just think that, you know, he is – he, he, Paul Dano did an amazing performance. I haven't heard of him before in other mm-hmm. things, but I have heard that he's had he he's a brilliant, brilliant actor and it really showed here. Yeah. And you know his interpretation of Riddler definitely far outpaces everybody else's. Um, just just almost to the level of say of say how of say some of the Joker interpretations. Uh, it was that scary. Um, and, you know, of course, I don't think it's going to be like Heath, Heath Ledger level mm-hmm. of scary. No, I don't think that. But I think it's a, it's a different take. And again, like I said earlier in, in the spoiler part here about how it compares to Kevin Spacey's character in Seven. Yeah. I mean, it's very comparable in a lot of ways. And I'm just like... That that character was just out, downright scary. It gives you nightmares. Uh, you know, you can't sleep at night. So it, it's not to, it's not to that level, but it, it's they're pretty close. Yeah, Paul did a. <clears throat> I think um, he did a great job in that. Just some of the way he delivered his lines behind a mask, on a mm-hmm. on a phone, right? Because you saw a lot of videos of him instead to to try to really play up that right. creep factor. 
and uh, the way he screams and his voice is cracking, right? Um, yep. Definitely um, makes your blood curdle a little bit hearing that. Uh, uh, definitely makes your hairs, uh, you know. So he, he played up the creep factor very, very well. And then, of course, when he's unmasked, mm-hmm. I mean, he looks like a poor sap, like a little kid. You know, he's got, uh, to me, he's got yeah. a baby face, right? And to yeah. see that put together and just so unassuming, they obviously casted him perfectly for that, right? And, 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 and of course. definitely added to the intrigue and shock factor at the same time. And yes, uh, the, the way the way invoke QAnon and the way incels are, the fringe, as you sp- speak of, uh, definitely ties into a lot of the real world people today, you know, just, uh, again, totally unhinged, off the wagon, conspiracy theories, and then thinking they can take everything into their own hands and they are the only ones that can do something about it, you know, so those are all um, definitely um, uh, indicators of how the world is today and how they want to make that social commentary as well, using the Riddler. Mm-hmm. And again, as we spoke of before, the way they took this modern interpretation of the Riddler to make him to make him scarier, you know, again, far cry from Jim Carrey and uh, Frank Gorshin, their interpretations of the previous Riddlers. Uh, this one's definitely in the, in the scary space and definitely firmly belong in Arkham Asylum, <laughs> as we saw in the end. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this is Joker level stuff. Yeah. It's not like you know, it's like the most menacing parts of Joker. Um, it's up there. Yeah. It's up there uh, in terms of in terms of that. So I, I just think that yeah, being much more scarier than anything else uh, that you've seen. You know, it's not even his riddles are are not even playful. They're they're, they're actual puzzles yeah. that you have to figure out. And you know, <laughs> and and also you know the videos. Yes, you know they played that from Dark Knight, mm-hmm. very similar to what the Joker did to Dar- in Dark Knight. But it, it was scary stuff because it, it, you know I think someone someone one of my friends actually mentioned it was like saw light. And yeah. It was like, yeah. Saw creativity. Ways, it is like saw jigsaw, light. right? Yeah. yeah. He definitely came off mm-hmm. like jigsaw. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I mean, I mean, there, there's there's definitely that part there and. Um, and you mentioned also the Telltale series, mm-hmm. uh, the video game. That that would that reminded me of that too. Yeah, 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 uh, it, yeah. That that goes back to also Telltale, where they um, uh, that that's also along the lines of where they take Thomas Wayne and his questionable gray areas in history. Uh, so they definitely play that up in that video game as well. Um, mm-hmm. So great job, Paul Dano. Yes, the Penguin. Um, we we talked a little bit about uh, Colin Farrell there with the great makeup and such. Uh, I definitely want to see more of the Penguin. It looks like we're probably going to get more of the Penguin in some kind of TV show on HBO Max. I say great, mm-hmm. and we saw a version of the Penguin here that is already established, but it sounds like it looks like he's definitely not at the top of the pecking order, uh, as he mm-hmm. was a one of the minions, or or I'm going to guess a capo of. Uh, of uh, Falcone uh, in this particular movie. Mm-hmm. But uh, again, uh, he uh, definitely a different interpretation, not a Danny DeVito, disgusting, uh, got the stuff coming out of his mouth or anything like that, or cartoony in any way. He definitely came off like a like a mob character uh, that you would see. Mm-hmm. And, and, and again, with the makeup, uh, completely, um, completely different character for what uh, Colin Farrell ha- is used to playing. And definitely his good looks are hidden under all that makeup. And he did a great job, especially mm-hmm. with the voice, the uh, the accent that he got down, that New York accent. And uh, again, I thought he really stuck out to me quite a bit. Yeah, I, I think that I think that they, they're trying to slowly build him up because he is definitely one of the lieutenants. He's not really the big the big mm-hmm. man. Um, but but, you know, kind of it kind of alluded to the fact that he's going to be the big man, you know, now that now that Falcone's like eliminated he's gonna he's gonna kind of take over everything yeah. so uh I, I just think that yeah you're gonna definitely see a lot him more of the shady dealings no i don't think that he's gonna be a main main villain yeah. um yeah. but i think that he's gonna be one of those shady villains on the side that you know batman's gonna have to thwart or or ask for information you know just like what just like what happened in this one where he kind of asked for information and things like that you know he's probably going to be that type. Going to serve that type of role, always in the shadows. You know, always trying to you know outsmart him, but 
definitely not going to outsmart Batman in, in, in many ways. It's just, but he's definitely going to be a player in that rogues gallery. Yeah, yeah. I, um, he yeah. had a, he was definitely a part of a very great sequence in there. Uh, one of the nice action scenes, the the car chase scene uh, that we see oh, in yeah. the uh, trailer. I thought that was great, and uh, the uh, we we got to see the Batmobile there and. Uh, and speaking of the Batmobile, what did you think of back with that Batmobile here? It's definitely a muscle car this time around. Yeah, I, I it's still not my favorite one. <laughs> I think that I think that the the one that is my favorite is probably still actually the Batman Forever one. Mm. Um, that one was just sleek. It's expensive. Batman it's just Forever. it went up the wall. Is, is that the one the with the hydraulics? <laughs> yeah, that went up the building. You know, yeah. uh, so I. That that one kind of that, that one kind of sticks out to me as a as a child. Um, the other ones, the tumbler, okay, it's kind of the back tank, mm-hmm. and then the and then what else is there? Uh, Justice League. I think they did they show the tank in Justice League. I think they at did. the end. Yeah, at the yeah, end. At yeah, the they end. did show the tank from from, from Dark Knight. Yes, Returns. that one. But yeah. um, but uh, but yeah, I I just think that this one this one's pretty good. I think it it's not it's not probably it's not near my top list but still yeah. pretty pretty fair yeah. i would say yeah it's not bad yeah. for a first uh batmobile i guess uh it's uh, you know starting with a muscle car in that way i'm sure we're expected to see its evolution in future movies if they come up with a sequel uh, it's not bad i i, I can definitely uh, see why it would be one of the first cars so hopefully He'll have a better imagination, <laughs> better creativity with future versions of Batmobile. Uh, but this one was, wasn't too bad. But my favorite was definitely, you know, I still love the 66, 1966 Batmobile from that time. Oh, that one. I, I grew up watching that, you know, all the reruns uh, on TV. And to me, that was still uh, the, uh, the, the the interpretation of the Batmobile at that time. But this one wasn't too bad. Uh, the muscle car being able to not only chase them, chase them down, catch up to Penguin, take him out, and um, we didn't see a lot of gadgets on it. It wasn't. Uh, we did get to see a bat phone, I think, when he was calling to see how Alfred uh, or trying to warn Alfred, right? But that that's about it. Otherwise, the uh, muscle car not too bad. It was it was a pretty good intro for that. Now I do question: Did he know? When did he park that car in that corner? Like, <laughs> right? Like, where did it come from? Did, was it automatically just put there? Did he? Did they know they were always going to be there? Uh, that, it was h- highly convenient for that car to just right be right there. It, it would have made yes, more sense so. to me if they. I think if he stuck with the motorcycle, because I, I think that that mode of transportation, which he used frequently throughout the movie, the motorcycle, um, mm-hmm. and then I didn't get to see the detail toward the end. Uh, it actually shaped in the bat ears in the front, the whole fairing mm-hmm. that he had on there. Um, so he used a motorcycle quite a bit, and that made a lot more sense to me. But they definitely needed a chase scene, so they got it with the uh, with the Batmobile. <laughs> right. Um, and and speaking of Alfred, as as he made the phone call to Alfred, um, we have Andy Serkis uh, in this role, and he seems to be doing a lot more parts now where he gets to show his face he gets to do his acting uh, outside of the uh, motion captures and such uh, but mm-hmm. we didn't seem to get enough of him what, what do you think yeah I, I think it might have just came down to scheduling conflicts and also pandemic because he did direct venom 2 around uh, probably the true. same time yes. too so yes. so he probably <laughs> he probably was preoccupied with a lot of different things um but yeah, we didn't really get to see Alfred that much in this movie. Um, I think I think that I think that for him, it it, it kind of speaks to um, Bruce. Uh, I think that because you know Bruce is more with Alfred and Alfred is more with Bruce instead of with Batman. I think that that's where they kind of lost that in the shuffle. I mean, it's a very delicate balance here and there. I think that again. Jeremy Irons just did a very better job. <laughs> he did. He did. Yeah, yeah. I, I just, I, I, I just like him kind of insulting him mm-hmm. and saying that you know, I just like, I just like the whole his whole kind of like cynical vibe about yeah. about Bruce and like, Sarcasm, yeah, this is how he is. Snarkiness, but, uh, all, all the sarcasm, <laughs> snarkiness. And I just like that so much more. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
yeah, but I mean, I mean, yeah, Andy Serkis did a good job uh, overall, but it was it was more of I think the only big part was the whole reveal of um, of you know tell him telling him about his father. Why didn't you tell me about that? And then he really strongly defended it, defended his father, yeah. saying that you know he had to he had to do what he had to do, but he didn't actually ask him to kill mm-hmm. him, of course. But but at the same time, you know. You know, was he complicit? Yeah, I mean, I mean, was Alfred complicit in that? Yes, but but I think that he did what he had to do to protect his family, and you know, and the whole that's a that's a cliche in a, in a lot of ways, but at the same time, I think that he delivered it uh, fairly well um, on the hospital bed. Yeah. yeah, and that it did bother me that fake out of his death. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I was like, come on! I, I, at first, I thought, oh, are they going to really do this? They're going to. Are they going to actually kill him off in this first movie in this way? And then, of course, that fake out happened, and and uh, I was a little disappointed. I thought it was a little cheap uh, in that part. And then he got to tell his um, exposition part of the story about, as you said, uh, about Thomas Wayne. Uh, so he was needed for that, <laughs> right? Uh, right. But you know, it, it, the fake out kind of deflated me just a little bit on that part. And, but again, Circus did fine, but I don't think they gave him enough. The, he definitely needed a little bit more meat to his uh, part. Um, mm-hmm. But he was just there to drive the plot, right? He just moved the plot along, yeah. and that was it. So not much there. Again, Jeremy. Well, he actually he actually did do the did do the riddles. He did help with the riddles. I think that, that yeah, was yeah. Like the majority True. of the movie. In the beginning, that yeah, he did. He did. Yeah. He did. But yeah. uh, it, it'd be nice yeah. to see a little bit more of that, and but we didn't get to mm-hmm. see that. And yes, Jeremy right. Irons, I agree with you. To me, he is the uh, uh, he is Alfred. <laughs> He's definitely Alfred. <laughs> and then we also yeah. have Falcone, uh, played by John Turturro. Uh, normally, I don't mm-hmm. see him in roles like this, so it's definitely very different for me. For me, I always see him in funny roles and comedy roles. And uh, right. so in this one, uh, I didn't expect to. I didn't know what to expect. As soon as I saw him, I, I immediately started laughing because I was thinking of. Um, uh, what is it, Big Lebowski? <laughs> oh, you're thinking of Jake yeah, Lebowski? Yeah, I was thinking of Big Lebowski and all the other roles, like in Transformers. He's always playing a goof, Transformers, goof, some yes. goofball funny guy, right? And it's hard to take him seriously, but uh, he, he right. did fine. He came off menacing. He came off uh, scary and uh, not as scary as I would like. Someone that immediately has presence where you look at him like, oh, yeah, that's a bad guy. <laughs> that's, that's definitely a bad guy. That's yeah. a bad guy you don't mess with. And that's a bad guy. That's at the uh, at the top of the uh, food chain when it comes to the mob, right? Uh, but I, I didn't right. see him that way at all. Uh, how about you, Colin? Yeah, I, same same here. I just remember him from Transformers. <laughs> I'm just like, no, this is a Transformers yeah. guy. He's just he's just a. Uh, but but yeah, he he definitely did. He sell me on the fact that he was menacing. No, because. He's from Transformers. He had three movies in Transformers. Yeah. So you go. Know, that's a that's a really big thing to overcome if you if you. you been that type of side character like play for laughs type of character <laughs> um and it's, it's very interesting also is that he he did play a dramatic role i don't know if you ever watched the um there was a there was a movie made by espn um called the bronx is burning and he played billy martin um yeah it's it was on espn for a while it was uh, it was during the they were retelling the 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 Yankees championship in the nineteen in the mid nineteen seventies along with the Sun and Sam Burgers, okay. and so he actually played Billy Martin, the manager, um, from that. I don't know if it's on. If, I don't know if it's on Disney Plus or on ESPN Plus. I'm not mm-hmm. sure. I've been trying to look for it, but but uh, but it was definitely a very. Uh, I think Oliver Platt played George Steinbrenner. Mm-hmm. Um, it was it was really interesting um, take. So he has had some. Dramatic roles in the past. What um, is Steinbrenner? That he had. Interesting. He looks nothing like him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Flat yeah. Steinbrenner. It was Flat Steinbrenner. But anyways, yeah. That that was that was the last dramatic role that I saw him in. And yes, you've seen you've seen him in a lot of other things. Mm-hmm. Also, um, Zohan. Oh, <laughs> that's right. Zohan. It, he's been so many movies. Like I said, he's been in a lot of comedies, right? And yeah. The dramatic roles don't really stick out as much. Um, no, it doesn't. You know, so, yeah, and that, that's yeah. that's the only thing. I, I just wish they, you know, I, I'm sure he, he did fine in the role, but it would be nice if he yes. came off a little bit scarier as Falcone, the guy, the mob boss, right? Uh, so, sure. But so, yeah, that's, that's what sure. we 
got out of him. And then finally, we have uh, a, a reveal at the end. Uh, it's kind, kind of a throw in. I don't know if it's necessarily an Easter egg of any kind, but uh, Riddler is in Arkham and he is uh, pretty pissed off. His plan did not go very well. And who's there to console him in, in the next cell over? And it, it looks like it is the Joker, played by Barry Keegan from, uh, from where we last saw him in The Eternals as Druig. Yes. You know, so, uh, yes. Uh, what did you think about uh, that reveal there? That was a very, very big mind blown. Uh, when I saw that, I was like totally mind blown that he was going to be the Joker and he's going to play the Joker. Um, you see, you, you've seen a lot of these crossovers, DC, Marvel, Marvel, DC, uh, in smaller characters. But I mean, I mean, he he did have a small role in Eternals, pretty significant one, if you know, as I recall. Yeah. But you know, I don't think there has been a character that is that big that crossed over to both franchises, like yeah. both uh, both sides. I think Lawrence Fishburne probably is the closest mm-hmm. one um, because he played Perry White and also um, Goliath in Ant Man yeah. and the Wasp. So so I think. That's probably the only two. Probably Zazie Beats as well, but Zazie Beats was in Deadpool and Joker. Yeah. So it's like that's kind of like two offshoots, you know, the universe in some ways. Oh my goodness! Now, now we're going to be coming up with. Let's see who else uh, crossed over a lot. Jaimon Hansu did a lot of uh, uh, both Marvel and uh, he was also an Aquaman. Yeah. Uh, what else was he in? Uh, Shazam, right? Yeah, he was Fusion also in Guardians, Guardians of the Galaxy. He Guardians was, of the Galaxy, that's yeah, right. So, yeah, so yeah. so there, there, there are a couple of crossover ones, but I don't think that it goes to the level of, I, I would say, a Barry Keegan right now. I think, yeah. you know, if he's going to continue to be the Joker mm-hmm. and then he's still going to be in Eternals, mm-hmm. I mean, that's like that's like double duty right there. So, it is. yeah, it's going to be fascinating for to, to kind of see that in action, you know, because he's going to have to he's definitely going to have sequels. Yeah. So to both movies. So that's if they definitely decide to go with the Joker, right, it, it, as the next villain. I mean, we would like to think that that's what they're teasing. Um I'm trying. I was trying to figure out what version of the Joker it was because you could see definitely the disfigurement in his face, but I couldn't tell if it's the it's the one we saw in the comics where his face is like ripped off, right? He cut his own face mm-hmm. off and then just put it back on right. that way. I couldn't tell if it was that version or not because uh, it was just a little dark for me. I, I couldn't really see, but uh, but just that little snippet that he gave, I, I thought he did fine, and it definitely left me wanting more. Uh, to see what his take would be on Joker as well. Yeah, I, I mean, even even his like the way that he appeared, it's looked like like the like the one from Long Halloween. Yeah, like yeah, the yeah. like the drawing. Okay, okay, like that interpretation. But also, which other one? Also, it's kind of like Red Hood. Mm. Uh, if you saw that animated movie mm-hmm. Red Hood, but it's not really okay. Okay, not really that one. Yeah, but um, yeah. But that's the, yeah. But they, it has been speculated online that it was um, that they were going to do the face off okay. uh, thing. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I mean, it would be very interesting if they do do that because it has been done before um, in the. And also, um, it was also speculated that you know because his, his whole face was damaged by the chemicals, his whole body is damaged by the chemicals. So they haven't done the whole damage part. They only did the kind of like the face part mm-hmm. being damaged. So. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. We'll see what kind of happens with with this interpretation, and whether or not they are going to go joke, Joker, or is it that it's a prequel yeah. that he he you know he's been in there, yeah, yeah. so that means that he had been that Batman had already probably faced him before, you know, in the past. So yeah. it could have been some year one thing that he did with Joker. So that's why he's in there now, yeah. and you know, could that open up a sequel for HBO Max? I don't know, but. That's another way to look at it so that they don't have to do the same thing again, you know, yeah. with the second movie being a Joker movie. Yeah, I, I, I'll be honest, as much as I would love to see his interpretation, I don't want to see another Joker movie at all. Mm. Um, I, I think uh, just like the way people are kind of fatigued by Lex Luthor being Superman's arch enemy that's being portrayed on screen all the time. It's the same with Joker. Can, can we find someone else? Right. So hopefully right. it's just a little throw in. Um, as a little Easter egg, uh, and uh, and we'll see somebody else if there is a sequel. I hope there's a sequel, by the way. 
uh, mm-hmm. and, and that they uh, find a, a different villain or different take on or some other villain that we'll see in the future. I mean, I mean, we haven't seen we all oh, we did see Mister Freeze, but in Batman and Robin, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you did mention Court of Owls in the yeah. past. So I mean, there are still some things in the Rogues Gallery that is very compelling that there haven't been any interpretations of it. I think that going to the Joker is just too soon yeah. also because we just had the Joker movie. In I know. <laughs> you know, we just had that. So it's like, it's too soon yeah. to kind of get into that, unfortunately. So it would behoove Warner Brothers to just go somewhere else with this instead of just going back to the same well. And, you know, because we've seen it so many times already. Yeah. So they, like you said, so they dropped another hint as well. And I, I, you and I talked about it briefly. I couldn't tell what they, where they were going with uh, going with this, but it just seemed like some little throw in as well when they flashed the word "hush" on the screen. So "hush" mm-hmm. is another yes. storyline in the Batman comics. Uh, so it's very possible they dropped that little hint, and maybe maybe they explore that later. I, I don't know. And then the other part that I saw that I didn't see it this way, but I was reading about it online, and they talked about it where uh, when he injected himself. With that, uh, I thought it was adrenaline, but clearly it was a greenish liquid. So everyone's saying, hey, is that the predecessor to the venom the liquid? Bane. You know, and, and Bane, right? Possibly in the future. So did did Bruce Wayne somehow tap into the uh, the early pinnings of of the venom liquid, right? The uh, uh, interesting, yeah. So you know, that's 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 uh, that's another little thing that that people are trying to pick up on and see where this might be going as part of the sequel. And they also name dropped Bloodhaven, right? Blood, uh, right, right Catwoman did. did. Bloodhaven and Bloodhaven, mm-hmm. everyone knows uh, following the comics, that's Nightwing territory uh, where he calls right. home. Uh, so mm-hmm. so lots of different little callbacks, um, Easter eggs that, that they kind of threw in there. And uh, But again, uh, would love to see another detective story. And uh, Court of Owls would be a good one too. I think uh, it really would be. Yeah. Uh, of course, they would have to change it around a little bit because everyone who's read the comics already know that story. Uh, and mm. then finally, the music. I want to talk about um, the music. Michael Giacchino. He, um, you know, I'm a big fan of uh, this composer. He does a lot of great work. Uh, everything that he's done, everything's touched, has been pretty good. This one here, uh, while it fit the movie. My criticism was it just seemed like he stuck on one line throughout the whole movie and just played it over and over and over and over again. And, of course, that did contribute to the overall atmosphere of dread and uh, that somber uh, mood uh, that everyone was uh, experiencing. But that's uh, that's certainly what uh, I took away from it. What did you think of the music, Colin? I think that it was very, very well done. Um, it's probably not to the level of Hans Zimmer, but still, still was very good, very menacing, very, it's, again, presents a very dark interpretation of what, what it's all about. So uh, definitely really good in that uh, regard, the music. Yeah. So um, overall, Colin, where do you rank this movie? Oh, man. I, I don't know. I actually think that it's, well... How many movies have we done in in terms of Batman? Uh, I would say I, I like it better than the Burton ones. Mm-hmm. Definitely better than the Schumacher ones. Um, is it better than Batman? Well, I would say it's better than Dark Knight Rises. Okay. So um, I probably... So in terms of the okay, we have got the Snyder, it's the Snyderverse, and then Nolan. So I would say Nolan's probably definitely better than Snyder. Okay. So Snyder's probably in the middle. Yep. Then we got the Nolan Nolan series. Is it better than Batman Begins? Uh, I would say yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I would agree. I would have to go I would have to go top two, like like what you said earlier yep, yep. in our when we were offline. I would say top two. Um, Dark Knight I think still. still there because the way that i interpret it is that um <clears throat> there were some parts where it went to the level of dark knight yeah. in this movie yeah. but it's not sustained mm-hmm. it's not sustained it's it there, there's definitely some good parts to it that's like wow that's dark knight level mm-hmm. stuff and wow i'm like really thrilled but dark knight is just too well done yeah. too well done and just all very consistent throughout and just 
wow, you know, still still probably the best best comic book movie ever made was Dark Knight. Yeah, I, I still put Dark Knight up there. Uh, that's how I ranked it as well. Dark Knight and then yeah. The Batman. While The Batman has a better detective story, it doesn't have Heath Ledger in that performance, which was extremely memorable. Um, and, and obviously he did an awesome job as the Joker. Um, and, mm-hmm. and plus playing a role like Joker being as over the top as he is, it's, it's hard to top that, right? He really sticks out in any other Batman grounded movies, uh, uh, grounded in reality type movies. Uh, he's really going to stick out. Uh, Riddler definitely sticks out as scary cause he's a little bit more real world, I guess not as, mm-hmm. not as, uh, over the top as Joker, but the dark Knight really sticks out in that way. And, um, so yeah, and the way he uh, Nolan filmed that movie, pieced it together, yeah, it's it's definitely considered a masterpiece. Definitely, the scoring was better. The score, uh, Hans Zimmer in that one. So put it all together: Dark Knight number one, The Batman number two for me. Okay, all right. Yeah, I, w- I would say the same. And then and then it kind of I think I think that for me it's probably going to be. Batman Begins number three, and then probably one of the Snyder movies. Uh, probably, probably be Batman v Superman. I liked it. Mm-hmm. Some people hated it, but I liked it because of Ben Affleck in it. So yeah, yeah that's just me. yeah. You can't beat that warehouse scene too. That that was just a oh, come badass on, yeah. warehouse scene, right? <laughs> Absolutely. So yeah, so, no, you can't, you can't. And CrossFit and CrossFit, bro. Come on, <laughs> you know, you gotta, yeah. That just anyone who wants to wants to be so chiseled and 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 like. Buff, yeah, you, you gotta you gotta watch that. Yeah, he definitely comes off as the more uh, the the best comic book interpretation of of Batman. Mm-hmm. Well, that brings right. us to the end, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, please tell us what you think of the Batman and what you thought of our, our reviews as well. Do you agree with us or do you not? And until uh, next time, for our next reviews, thank you, everyone. Bye. <laughs>